today. We did have Jerry Mitchell Victor, a professor from Harvard in Earth Science. I think I first met Jerry perhaps in the University of Toronto back in the day. Uh, Jerry is a professor there and also did your PhD there. And I learned today also was born in Australia uh, and then moved to Canada. Since, since that time, Jerry's done a lot of work. Uh, I could list some of his uh, accomplishments, and I'll just list one or two. I'll give you a gauge of his success in doing research. Uh, basically, he's the father of the Royal Society of Canada and of the American Geophysical Union. And I think those kind of things uh, speak volumes of the research Jerry has done in quality. One of his PhD students is now with us here at NYU in New York, uh, I love my Gomez. And uh, so Jerry's going to talk about uh, one of the things that uh, at least I know them well for, and perhaps most of the community, this idea of fingerprinting. I think I first heard about this around 2001, but maybe you were working on it well before that, or beginning of this time. About this idea. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea, and I don't think it really took traction for two or three years. It's like people saw the paper, and, and then now it's like people talk about this, like common knowledge, don't know about this. <laughs> it wasn't so long ago they didn't. So with that, I'd like to welcome Jerry to begin his talk, and uh, thank you. Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, okay, I'm, we should just start at, at the beginning, try to give you some context for this. I'm sure everyone knows about global change and climate warming, but still it's a good idea to review the underlying reasons that sea level is going up, the reasons why it's accelerating, and accelerating at an unprecedented rate. So we all know that the Earth's o oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface, 4 kilometers on average, but uh, 11 kilometers at its lowest point, the Marianas Trench, just off the coast of the Philippines, 80% of the world's population live within 60 kilometers of the coast. I was happy to move to Boston because I got back to the coast. I live about 100 meters off the coast in Melbourne. The fact is that we do live in mega cities. This is an example of Queensland on the left is New York, and three quarters of these are located adjacent to oceans. And you don't need me to remind you at the Sandy what that can mean when you combine sea level rise with storm surges, the kind of level of damage that can occur. So most of you will know this, but it's still important to review it, uh, particularly in a public lecture. The underlying reasons for the rise in sea level, the melting of the ice sheets of the paper published last month in Nature, which I think has now convinced everyone that those ice sheets have begun to collapse. It's no longer an academic exercise. Is that solar radiation passes through the atmosphere, warms the Earth, both land and oceans, that gets re-emitted, some of that gets trapped by the atmosphere because of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide people talk about a lot. I study, even though this talk is going to be about the modern sea level, I mostly study paleo sea level, ancient sea level. And there you can look at the trigger for a variety of reasons, not just on CO2. There are examples where people think methane was the reason for the warming, water vapor, etc. This is a natural process. It keeps the atmosphere about 60 degrees warmer than it would be in the absence of an atmosphere. But the problem is this, and that is that now we've reached an unnatural level of CO2 in our atmosphere. I'm not showing you anything you haven't seen. CO2 levels now, this is the, so these are the ice age cycles, right? Natalia and I study uh, sea level through the ice age cycles, these 100,000 year periods when ice sheets grew and then diminished, grew and diminished, and you see that here. And you can see that over roughly the last million years, CO2 levels always remained less than 300 parts per million. They've now reached 400 parts per million. There's a story in the New York Times where that level was first reached. And the question is, where will it reach in another 90 years? Depends on your emission scenario. Most people would put it in the middle here at around 700 parts per million. So by the end of this century, we'll be at two and a half times the level of CO2 in the atmosphere than we ever reached in the preceding million years. So this has led to sea level rise for a variety of different reasons. I'm going to be talking about sea level rise today associated with melting of ice sheets glaciers, expansion of the water, but sea level can change for a variety of reasons. I'll be discussing this exchange of water stored on land into the oceans. There's also warming. In the 20th century, 
the amount of sea level rise associated with the warming of the ocean was roughly equivalent to the amount associated with melting glaciers and glaciers. But as we move into this century, nobody projects that to remain the case. All projections took place this as a dominant contributor to what we're about to see in the next 80 to 90 years. There are issues associated with subsidence, just natural processes, sediments being brought out into deltas that cause subsidence, tectonic effects, terrestrial water storage, both natural and man-made. In fact, we can now see with satellite data, satellite altimetry data, you can see the effect of groundwater pumping in a major metropolitan area with no difficulty. So all of those things can affect sea level. And that's what makes it a very complicated thing to study as we'll see. Now, if you want to understand sea level in the 20th century, you look at tide gauges. These are remarkably low-tech devices in this satellite world that we live in. Uh, people are always expecting you to show images of satellites and satellite maps. But in the 20th century, the data set were tide gauges. These are simple cylinder-like objects, metallic. There's a, sort of like a ping pong ball float in the middle of it. And as water goes up and down, that float goes up and down. The cylinder tends to filter out tidal effects. And as long as you can measure where that ping pong ball is as a function of time, you get a measure of sea level and how it's changed as a function of time. Now, the important thing about tide gauges is that they've been out there, in some cases, for 300 years. The Swedes put their first tide gauge out in the 18th century. So they represent a very long record of sea level change that's very useful. Satellites, and I'll talk a little bit about satellite data later on in this talk, have only been out there for 20 years. And the problem with sea level is that it varies on all sorts of time scales. So for me to tell you what the long-term trend is, I need to look back further than just the 20 years for satellite data. That's a central problem in sea level research. And this is just a set of images, Liverpool, the Antarctic, etc. These have very low-tech places. They tend now to drop off rather than being rebuilt. So the number of tide gauges grew, grew, grew until around the year 2000. And now it's diminishing because when they go offline, nobody thinks they're worth rebuilding. But in fact, they are. OK, here's where tide gauges are. This is a location of 900 tide gauges around the Earth's surface, uh, located largely in the northern hemisphere. Some of them have only been collecting data for a few years. Some collect the data in the 50s and stop collecting data. Some have been continuous records of sea level for the last 200 years or so. So this is the record that we see. Now, if you look at just the global average, if you take all of those tide gauges, lump them together, and take the global average, and near the end of the talk, I'm going to show you why what seems to be a very logical thing to do has led us astray for the last 100 years. But let's start with the mainstream way of doing this. You just take the global average of tide gauges and the rates. This is sea level in millimeters throughout the 20th century. It's clearly going up. If you take the average, this is not really to be believed because there's so few data here that it's not statistically significant. The most important thing in this plot is that most people would now agree that in the 20th century, sea level uh, rose on an average rate of 1.6 millimeters per year. So. Okay, so this is setting the stage. But now let's go back seven or eight years. Very few people in mainstream sea level research would disagree with the conclusion from that last slide. Okay, although I'll show you something at the end which will make you a little bit skeptical. But nonetheless, if you went back seven or eight years and you looked online uh, to any site in which uh, people were denying that we had an influence on climate, they would list, it would be like a David Letterman top ten. And three of them would deal with sea level in whatever order they were. The first was, well, don't believe it. We're not causing uh, climate to warm because sea level is going up at different amounts in different places on it. Right? And that doesn't fit our view that if you melt an ice sheet, sea level would go up relatively uniformly. Right? That's the first thing. This was actually usually number two on that they learned on this, right? The second one, which is much easier to rebut, is that sea level has been rising for thousands of years. I don't even know why they bothered with this. It's so obvious that that's not true. But I'll show you some evidence in case you go to a talk like this one and somebody suggests that what we're seeing in the 20th century, we've seen for the last few thousand years. You can rebut them in five ways in less than a minute. <laughs> the third is, it's not going to get worse. That what we saw in the 20th century is a stable sea level rate moving into the 
21st century, or the, 20th, uh, the next 22nd century. The problem with that is it already has got worse too late. So let's look at each one of these. these. This talk is going to try to describe ideas that will allow us to answer these questions or rebut these issues one by one. So we'll start with this one. Sea level change is different from place to place, and that's the origin of what David was talking about earlier, fingerprints that I'll talk to you about. Here's an example. It's certainly true. Sea level is going up and down at varying rates all over the globe. Those tide gauges are not all measuring 1.6 millimeters per year. Some of them show sea level going down in Helsinki and Stockholm. It's doing this. Just to give you a sense, this is the 20th century. And this is meters, so this is sort of 40 centimeters or so. Okay? So it's going down, in this case, by 6 or 7 millimeters per year, right? not up by 1.6. In other places, like Aberdeen in Scotland, it's doing nothing at all. And there are places like Boston, where I live, where it is going up roughly the global average. Actually, that's a little bit higher than the global average. And there's a reason for that. So just looking at that, that was a map you'd see on the website. And they'd say, how can this be? because of melting ice sheets. Sea levels are doing different things everywhere around the globe. Right? That's the argument. OK, so let's look at that a little, with a little bit more detail. Let's look at a site. I don't want to bias the, uh, what I'm going to tell you. So I'm picking 22 or 23 sites that were published in a 1997 paper that suggested were the sort of gold standard sites at sea level. The problem with this, and I'll, I'll return to this, is you can't convince anyone if you've only chosen 24 sites out of 900. So we don't do any analysis with 24 sites now. We do it with 900. But I want to give you an example of the sort of state of the art in the year 2000. So we use these 23 sites. Let's look at them. They were chosen to avoid cities because New York, you wouldn't want to put a tide gauge in New York because there's so much groundwater pumping, you're subsiding and construction, the city subsiding. Right? And so that would have nothing to do with ice sheets. So you avoid cities like New York, Boston, San Francisco, etc. You stay away from plate tectonics. You stay away from boundaries between tectonic plates. Because those can be go those regions, the crust in those regions can be going up and down for a variety of reasons, as you're well aware. Earthquake or no, there are vertical motions of land in locations close to where earthquakes are. And you don't want to have, the, according to this fellow, you don't want to have a tide gauge record that's less than 30 years, because he argued you have these 10-year or 20-year cycles in sea level, which are not well understood. And he said, if I want the long-term trend, I need to have a record that's long enough that I'm not getting fooled by this up and down with the 10-year trend. So when he did that, he found those 23 sites. Now let's look. He here is showing, is he showing in that last slide? Sorry? Is he showing? Is those three data points are in California, and that's a state there. Right, so that's a good point. So he's arguing, so you'd say, OK, wait a minute. You told me to stay away from tectonic plate boundaries. Um, so I started as a graduate student. So half of my PhD was in tectonics. The argument here is there's two kinds of, well, there's three, but two kinds of boundaries where large earthquakes occur. The San Andreas Fault, where a plate moves side by side. And you have a subduction zone, where one plate descends under another. What he argued was, you don't have to worry about transform folds. You don't have to worry about sites near the San Andreas Fault, because that sort of motion doesn't lead to up and down motion. But here are the rates you get at those 23 sites. I just grouped them by geography. These are European sites. Here we get into New Zealand, the west coast of the United States, South America, uh, east coast of the United States, right? at least key ones. And this is a sea level rate in millimeters per year. This was a, a plot that I first saw on one of these websites. And then you see that, well, wait a minute. There are problems here. Sea level is going up in some places by, le by less than a millimeter per year. And it's going up by nearly three millimeters per year in other places. If I showed you all 900, this stuff would be scattered everywhere. You'd see no trend with your eyeball, right? You see, this, but this is good enough to show you that there is something to this idea that sea level is changing by different amounts from place to place. Right? Okay, so that line here is the average of all these values, and you get that 1.6 I told you about, that 1.6 millimeter. Um, so that's where that number comes from. And if you did, if I showed you all 900 and I took an average, you'd still get around 1.6 millimeters per year. Okay. 
Okay? That's the average. But taking the average is assuming something. Right? Taking the average assumes what we call the bathtub model. I think Natalia and I came up with that. If an ice sheet melts, the view is sea level will rise uniformly. Here's an ice sheet, my version of an ice sheet. And you'll be surprised seeing this that I'm actually an art school dropout, but that's as good an ice sheet as I can produce. So that ice sheet goes from there to there, and water level more or less rises uniformly. That's what's in your head when you're looking at this app. Right? And that leads to problems, right? Because you want to know, why are these systematically lower than the average? These are all European sites. This has a name. In the literature of sort of around circa 2000, 2001, the argument that European tide gauges showed less than the average sea level rise was called the European problem. It didn't have a solution. Nobody understood. Why is it that Europe is not showing the global averages, right? And also, this variability here was, of course, not completely understood. People had ideas, of course, right? But they just wanted to wash it away by taking the average, right? Well, the problem is that this is completely wrong, okay? And so, Natalia and I modeled all sorts of processes related to sea level, some of which um, have many knobs to turn and parameters that we vary to get answers. This, what I'm about to show you has none. This, what I'm about to show you is simply Newton sitting under the apple tree, right? There is no debate, no serious scientist debate what I'm about to tell you, even though it's highly counterintuitive, right? The fact is, if I melt an ice sheet, sea level does not go up uniformly, not even close, right? If you melt an ice sheet, sea level will vary geographically, and here's why. And I, of course, exaggerated this extremely. But an ice sheet, just like the sun and the moon, and I shouldn't have to convince people who live near the ocean, you see ocean tides every day, but oceans go up and down, ocean levels, 12 hours, 24 hours, all sorts of things related to the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. Ice sheets also exert a gravitational pull on the water. Right? And they have an advantage. They're a lot smaller than the sun and the moon, but they're a lot closer. And so what ice sheets do is they draw water towards them, gravitation. Okay? When you melt an ice sheet, two things happen. The first is that you're certainly dumping more water in the ocean than was there before. The total volume and mass of the ocean is higher than it was yesterday. Right? But the other thing you do is you relax this tide because you cannot anymore hold on to that water in a strong way. The gravitational pull is reduced. So it turns out that very close to a melting ice sheet, sea level falls. Right? And the effect is huge. I'll show you. Right? And as you move away from the ice sheet, you pay the price out here. right? Because not only is water being thrown into the ocean, but it's all also moving away from the ice sheet and getting as far away as it can, because that ice sheet is no longer attracting it. As I said, this is just new. There is no parameter I'm turning. And so you pay the price here, but sea level falls here. And the question is, what is that point at which you go from a fall to a rise? And for many years in the literature, even though this problem was first solved in 1888, in many years in the literature, it was thought, people forgot, I guess, that that point, they thought that point was right at the edge of the ice sheet, so you'd never see this effect. Right? But in fact, it's 2,000 kilometers from an ice sheet. And I can't even start to convert that to miles. <laughs> Okay? Very far away. Oh, and, right. So, let's look at what this means now. Let's actually get away from this cartoon which I drew. And I should say that this cartoon is missing one important piece of physics that is actually involved in the calculations. That is, when you melt an ice sheet, the land also pops up. That's known as post-glacial rebound. I haven't included that here because it complicates the story, but it's an important effect. As the land comes up, it also pushes water away. Right? So now let's look at a computer simulation, which should be, I hope, relatively straightforward to describe. We take this earth of ours, here are those 24 sites, we look at Greenland, and we say, let's melt enough ice from Greenland so that if the bathtub was correct, sea level would have risen a meter. Right? Okay, so we're just throwing off enough ice. If you melted all of Greenland, by the way, and the bathtub was correct, sea level would rise seven meters. Okay? 
So we're taking about one seventh of Greenland melting and saying, what actually happens? Because if you believe the bathtub, you think that the whole ocean would see one meter. But this is what the ocean sees. This area in blue that surrounds Greenland, that's that area within 2,000 kilometers. That's the area that will experience a sea level fall if Greenland catastrophically collapses. Okay? That's Great Britain, yes, but it's Scotland, right? Uh, if you live in Newfoundland, I think that's where you're from, Dave. Okay? If you're in Newfoundland, you'd be happy to know sea level will fall. If you were at the edge of the Greenland ice sheet and the whole Greenland ice sheet melted tomorrow, something catastrophic could cause it to melt tomorrow, at your feet, sea level would drop 100 meters. This is a huge effect, right? But you pay the price the further you get away. That pull is lessened and water moves away from Greenland, right? And so if you happen to own vacation property in Tierra del Fuego, sea level will rise by 1.3, 30% more than the bathtub. This is a kind of Mercator okay projection which sort of exaggerates the pull. I should get away from these projections. But if you add up everything here and take the average, you come up with one. That's how much water we put in there. But you get higher here because you lose mass here. It moves away from it, right? And that zero point goes through, as I've said, Ireland, England, Sweden, Norway, both, all, both would see a sea level fall in this scenario, which is highly counterintuitive, right? But it's correct. And we can now look and ask each of these ice sheets, whether it's Greenland or the Antarctic or glaciers, will have their own effect on sea level. If any ice sheet melts, sea level will fall in the vicinity of that ice sheet. So in the case of the Antarctic, the sea level fall zone is near the Antarctic. In the case of Greenland, it's near Greenland. In the case of glacier melting, it's near the big glaciers, Patagonia here, Alaska here, Iceland, the, North, the Arctic glaciers. Right? If all of the glaciers melted, you see these dimples of sea level fall surrounding each one of these glaciers. Right? And that is an observed effect. This, again, isn't science fiction. This is easily observed in some places. So now let's ask, so this gets back to David's comment about fingerprints. Each ice sheet has a very distinct pattern of sea level change that will occur if it melts or if it grows. Every ice sheet has a distinct pattern, and that's why they come to be known as fingerprints. We didn't coin that term. We published the paper, but somebody else coined the term fingerprints, which is a very good idea. The idea now is to say, okay, remember that David Letterman top 10 thing? Sea level is going up non-uniformly. It's going up differently from place to place. Instead of worrying about that, it actually tells you something quite beautiful. By looking at that variation, you can actually say where the water is coming from. Right? In other words, you say, how much of this plus this plus this gives me what I observe in those tide gauges. Let's add up those three fingerprints, and instead of taking this average, let's add them up to try to fit this variability. And this is an example of that variability. So in other words, this was this data we worried about. Remember that European problem? It was lower than the average. But this is a particular summation. It's not even important for this talk. But this is us adding up fingerprints associated with Greenland, Antarctic, and mountain glaciers, and you can see that the fit is exceptionally good. Right? The European, so even with this simple physics, and when I say physics, people usually break out in a rash, but simple physics should be, the best physics is the simplest physics, right? If you think about this, if you look at Europe, just with this five minute lecture, if you look at Europe and you say sea level is falling or rising in Europe at lower than the average, that tells you something right away. It tells you that Greenland is being melted. Because the effect on Europe of Greenland melting would be less than it is everywhere else. The European problem is solved by recognizing that all this means is that Greenland was melting during the 20th century. And when Greenland melted, Europe felt much less the brunt that other people did of that sea level. So you can use this geographic variability. So there is nothing to this idea that because it varies from place to place, it cannot be human-induced global warming. That's just not. Right? You can take this a little step further. This is what we did. We looked at these plots, and we published a paper very recently, Natalia is on it, in which we looked at those, and we could say, 
going forward in time now to the end of this century, projecting sea level has become the big game in town. Everyone wants to project for obvious reasons, right? But it is a very difficult game to play because there are so many variables, right? But we can do one part of that game very well. We can look at these fingerprints and we can say, is there any area on Earth that will get more than the average regardless of which I should know? So we look at this and we say, is, is there an area here? Let's look at uh, South Africa, which is one of these places. You can see South Africa here is in a zone with more than the average if the Antarctic melts. That's also true here, and that's also true there. So if you happen to live in South Africa, in Johannesburg, you're in trouble, basically, because no matter which combination of ice sheets melt, the sea level you will see will be higher than the global average, no matter what happens. Right? But when I tell, I gave a talk in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, just two weeks ago, and I tell the Dutch government, you know, it's a problem for you because you need to know which ice sheet's going to melt. They glaze over. They can't believe it. Because all they care about is polar ice sheet melting. But if you say to them, but wait a minute, if Greenland melts, you're in much less trouble than you would be if the Antarctic melts. They still don't believe it. They simply don't believe it. Right? And it doesn't, it's not a problem at this stage because we don't really know which of those two things is going to melt by the end of the century. But the Netherlands is soon going to find out how important it is. Right? And if you're taking a train from Amsterdam, as I did, to the coast, and you just look around, and maybe most people don't do this, only sea level people do this, you look around and you think, you're, you're really in trouble here. There's not, nothing that's going to save the Netherlands. Right? In, in, regardless of what combination of ice sheets people project melting, Sea level rise in the Netherlands will probably be at least a meter. And as you put a train through there, or take a train through there, you realize, how are they going to stop that? But nevertheless, we've done this calculation where we said, where are the hot zones? Right? Well, one hot zone is here in the north, uh, uh, the northwest Pacific, South Africa, etc. So you can play these games to at least alert people to the fact that in these areas, it doesn't matter which ice sheet melts. You can't forget it. But in areas to the north and to the south, it will matter. Because in the north, if Greenland melts, they'll feel much less of an effect. Right? Yep. How long does it take to see the effect? In other words, yeah. I mean, the glacier melts, okay, the other side of the earth, based on your, your physics. Uh, how long does that take to equilibrate? It's a good question. Um, when we published our paper in 2001, the first paper on this, as scientists are wont to do, everyone jumps on the bandwagon and does those calculations. And it took two or three years until people reached consensus. And you'll be surprised, two weeks. Because this water from Mount Water will be mixed by tides. Right? And so the early papers said it might be 10 years, might be 20 years. But they wouldn't, weren't putting in the effect that tides have on mixing the ocean. So these effects, if Greenland did melt enough to raise sea level one meter, you would get that pattern in about two weeks. That would be all you need before that mixing gets water where gravity tells it to go. I want to include this because it was a New York Times article. It's quite old now. I can't see the date here. But it, I think sometime five, six, seven years ago mm -hmm. at least. They had this thing. As Alaskan glaciers melt, it's land rising. So Alaskan fishermen had noticed there's no doubt about it, Alaskan ice sheets, uh, glaciers, are uh, the, the melting at an accelerated rate. Every measurement, gravity measurement, whatever you look at, shows that those ice sheets are popping off, as people say, very quickly. So if you believe me, that means sea level should fall in Alaska, right? It's close to, um, along the coast there. And in fact, it is falling. Right? This article said it's because the land that's rising, but that was only part of the story. The other major part of the story they missed is it was because of gravity, right? It was that apple falling under the apple tree, right? So now let's move to the second. Sea level has been rising for thousands of years at a similar rate. And I enjoy answering this because it, it introduces so much really beautiful earth science, right? You can answer this question in a multitude of ways. So let's go through three or four very quick ones. Some will be uh, surprising to you, I think. The easiest way 
to answer that question is just to go to areas close to where I was born. All of these islands in the equatorial Pacific show the same features. This is a coral reef. It's dead now. It's, there's a live coral under the water. The top of that coral is 5,000 years old. And it's a few meters above sea level. Okay? Now, we understand, and that's another lecture which you probably won't want to hear because it's more technical than the one I'm giving here, that the reason for that mild sea level fall over the last 5,000 years. But think about it. If sea level was rising one and a half millimeter, forget one and a half, let's just say one millimeter per year, instead of for the last 100 years, for the last 5,000, this coral, this coral should be under 5 meters of water, 15, 16 feet of water. Right? It's not. There's no evidence anywhere in these equatorial regions that sea level has risen in the last two or 3,000 years by anything close to the amount that would be equivalent to what it's done in the last time. Right? And this is why people who make this argument, and I, I don't uh, pull punches here, people who make this argument, this argument is at least sophisticated in some way. This argument is the argument of charlatans, right? because it is so easy to rebut this idea. But it's the one idea the most. Right? And I shouldn't have said charlatans, somebody might ask me that here, because I generally get that question in a public poll. Okay? But let's do some more interesting geophysics. This is my opportunity to introduce you to stuff that's kind of fun for me. The first thing is, I'm involved with the group. Bob Cobb is a statistician at Rutgers, pretty close here, an hour, an hour and 15. And he and I and several other people, one of my postdocs, have looked at sea level. We've done a statistical compilation of all this kind of data. Thousands of data points spread around the globe over the last few thousand years that measure sea level. And this is the estimate of sea level that you get. So this is quite a sophisticated statistical analysis. Right? And this is the sea level change that you get. And this just looks slightly different from the one on my screen, but it still shows the right thing. So this is 2,000 years ago. So here is, we're going back 2,500 years. This is the 20th century. This is what sea level's done over the 2,000 years or so prior. And it turns out, when you do the statistical analysis, the amount of sea level rise in the last 100 years is greater than the amount in the last 2,400 years that preceded. Right? There's no doubt about it. That's a shocking fact, right? Not only did this sea level rise persist, which would have got us down there, the entire net total of sea level change in the preceding 2,300 years from the Industrial Revolution was small. I have a quick question. So many people attribute um, global warming to industrialization and right. emissions and so on and so forth. But at the beginning of the, uh, the common era, there was not industrialization. Right, so the question is exactly so. But we can agree that this is connected to the, the industrial era. But you're arguing about this trend. Yeah. What's well, causing that trend? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And, and I could give you a technical answer, but, and so I'm going to try not to do that. But, from 20 to 5,000 years ago, we had a major deglaciation. 20,000 years ago, Canada was under three, two miles of ice, right? And from 20 to 5,000 years ago, all of that ice locked up into higher latitudes melted. And what happened subsequent to that was a kind of tail end of melting. What you're seeing is the tail end of the ice age, right? Because ice sheets aren't going to just magically stop. 5,000 years ago. There's a trail, right? And that's what you're seeing here. But what you're seeing here is anomalous. And I'm going to show you something even more dramatic about that later on. Let me show you some other stuff. This is a colleague of mine. I never worked with him, actually, on a paper, but uh, I know his work intimately. He had a very good idea. He said, what's a good record of sea level rise over the last 2,000 years? And he, along with his Italian colleagues, archaeologists, colleagues in archaeology realized that wealthy Romans built fish tanks, fish holding tanks. So in each one of these places, you could just swim out. I've done it. I'll show you a picture of the archaeologists and the, certainly the Italian government doesn't think of them as having any archaeological interest whatsoever, so they don't protect them in any way. You can swim up with them. Right? These uh, wealthy Romans built 
these tanks. So fishermen uh, caught the fish, brought them in. The Romans put the fish in these holding tanks. They could eat them wherever they chose, right? Okay, they could hold them. And they were built to very careful specifications, right? So let's look at some examples of these. Here is his colleague, Kurt Lambeck, sitting on one of these fish holding tanks. So it's got various things here. Here's how they're built. This is kind of a diagram. This is the top of it. This is known as a sluice gate, so this has holes in it. And you can sort of pull this up or down if you'd like. But imagine, you, they would have had to build these tanks at a very precise time. If it was too low, high tide would come up and the fish would swim out. Right? If it was too high, there would not be enough circulation and the fish would die. Right? So these were built, I think it's like 20, here it is. These were built so that the top of this loose gate was, in our present units, 20 centimeters above, right? About 8 inches. I'm doing the conversions, right? Above, right? And that didn't have any hands or whatever the unit was that the, the Romans used. I'm not a historian. But they had the idea, well, let's go to those fish tanks because we know how high they were when they were built. We can now compare them. They were built 2,500 years ago. We can compare them. And when he did that, he realized that over the last 2,000 years, according to these calculations, it, and a number of, consistent with what I've shown you, sea level only grows by about 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters, right, at most, right, by looking at these fish tanks. Let's do something else, even more so, right? But I just want to give you an idea of how much work has gone into rebutting these ideas, right? Eclipses. Babylonians, Chinese, uh, Greeks to some extent, uh, they weren't astronomers, they were astrologers, eclipses were harbingers of bad tidings, right? But they wanted to precisely predict the occurrence of eclipses, right? And so they observed them as carefully, and they used uh, clocks that obviously aren't as accurate as they are today. Think of those hourglasses with sand, these things called clepsidras, which are basically hourglasses but with water instead of sand. Very finely calibrated to, the, to measure time. So what they did, and this is a little bit hard to describe, is they measured the occurrence of an eclipse. They said that eclipse, that Chinese astrologer slash astronomer, measured that eclipse to occur at a very specific time. And they recorded it. So what geophysicists do, is they go to those eclipses. We've done this sort of thing. Although we certainly have no role in putting together this incredible data set. And now you can do a calculation. And you can say, if the Earth was rotating as it is today, and that rotation stayed the same, and it never changed, you could predict when that eclipse should have occurred. And then you find that it did not occur when you predicted it to have occurred which tells you that the rotation rate of the Earth is changing. Right? And in fact, it's slowing. And we know why it's slowing. It turns out that 2,500 years ago, so this in that sense tells you if you have two clocks and you go back in time 2,500 years, one fixed to the actual rotation of the Earth and one that says today's rotation, they'll go out of sync by 1,600 seconds, which is 16,000 seconds, sorry, which is four hours. So if you go back 2,500 years, the time when these people were recording those eclipses was four hours off when you would have predicted by assuming the Earth's rotation rate had stayed constant. And this shows a slowing, and we know why it's slowing. This is slowing, the Earth's rotation rate is slowing because uh, tides break ocean waves at the margin of the shore, right? You go out to any ocean coast and you see breaking water waves. Every time you see that, that dissipates a little bit of energy and it slows the Earth. It's actually quite a complicated sequence of events that leads to the slowing, but that's enough. You're losing energy every time you see a wave. Any time you're, as Bostonians are in Martha's Vineyard, and you're enjoying the surf, the Earth's rotation rate is slowing each time you see that by a very small amount that adds up to this four hours and 2,500 years. But now think about it. If we were melting ice sheets throughout this period, so that is the prediction that comes from looking at water waves. You predict this slowing very accurately. Right? And believe it or not, and I'm not going to tell you why, this will be a 
puzzle, you have to email me if you want the answer. Right? We know this because of Apollo astronauts. Because they put mirrors up on the moon. And it turns out that if the Earth's rotation rate is slowing, the moon must be receding from the Earth. And so what we do now is we shoot laser beams up and back from those mirrors. And you measure the time. And the moon is actually moving away from the Earth by two centimeters, one inch per year. And that's a measure of all the energy that's lost. I know that's, that's the kind of physics that produces rations, right? But it's there. We understand it. This is well understood. But now think about it. If you melt ice sheets, water will leave the pole and enter into the oceans. You're moving water from here to here. And you know, well, the Canadians in the audience know, from looking at more figure skating than most people would want to see in their lifetime, that as the figure skater puts his or her arms out, you slow down the Earth's rotation. So melting of ice sheets will slow the Earth's rotation. Because you'll be taking the mass from here, the pole, and moving it here. Right? So if you melt it one millimeter per year from the last 2,500 years of those polar ice sheets, which you did not do, as I've tried to argue, that's what you would have seen. And this goes off the scale, but instead of four hours, you should see an offset of eight hours, if that were true. The fact that we don't see this is a very elegant demonstration, if you like physics, that those ice sheets have not been doing over the last 2,000 years what they're certain to have done over the last time. So now, the last. It's not going to get worse. Right? I've already told you the punchline, it already is. How do we know this? Well, here's that diagram I showed you earlier. 1.6 millimeters per year. That's the 20th century rate. And the argument goes, and this is still a very common argument, it's not going to get any worse than this. But now we do have satellites, and now we can look at what's happened in the last 20 years. So we have these satellite altimeters. These are satellites that shoot down radio waves, I think back and forth and they just bounce off the surface of the ocean and they whiz around and around and around and they're continually taking measurements of the elevation of the ocean. And you can imagine they have to do this continuously because they're also measuring tides and all these other things and they want to average out. So we could look at this. This was uh, really, when I was a graduate student, this just came online. People were going crazy trying to measure these things. It's very hard to do this work because imagine you're trying to determine the level of ocean to levels of a millimeter per year. So that means you need to know where the satellite is to better than that accuracy. Right? So all sorts of engineering feats went into accurately establishing the location of the satellites. And that satellite is not just shooting lasers or radio waves down to the surface of the ocean. It's also shooting it to points that are well understood, the location of those points, so that it can triangulate itself, geodesists talk about. So you can find out exactly where that is. And when you do that, and you measure for over 20 years, you get a rate over the last 20 years from satellites that's three millimeters per year. Right? So that tells you that in the 20th century, 1.6, last 20 years, three millimeters per year. So it has got worse, it's doubled. Our current rate of sea level rise has doubled relative to the 20th century average. I'm going to show you in a minute that it's worse than that. Okay, but this is now the mainstream sea level view of it, right? But let's go a little further. So I've written a paper with one of my postdoctoral fellows um, that's in review of nature, which has done the following. The problem, let's look at this again. This is where the tide changes are. What we've done in this paper is revisit this 1.6. We want to look at this again, and we want to look more carefully at it. Okay? And the reason we want to look more carefully at it is that you're not sampling the total ocean. Tide gauges are not whizzing. At the, tide gauges don't whiz around. Satellites do. Tide gauges are located where they're located. There's very few in the southern hemisphere, and certainly there's large sections in the northern hemisphere that aren't set sampled. So just even colloquially speaking, you can look at that and say, can you really get the global average by just measuring those 900? You'll do a pretty good job, but is it perfect? And the answer in this paper is, no, it's not. It turns out that you've overestimated sea level rise. Part of the reason you've overestimated sea level rise, you might be able to understand from this talk. Remember I told you that there are these areas of sea level fall near ice sheets that are melting? Well, you're not sampling much of that. You are a little bit here. 
but there's nothing close to the Antarctic. So by sampling the Earth this way, you're not getting those areas where sea level's falling. So you're going to overestimate the sea level rise. Right? And this is an example. So this is the old way. These, this line here is the actual numbers. I haven't sort of printed it up with a, a line. But this brown red thing here gives you the old 20th century rate that I've talked about, 1.6. But instead now, when you reanalyze this using very sophisticated statistical analyses that uh, this poor student has become an expert on because it's not the most exciting piece of science you can do. So Caroline spent a lot of her time at Harvard Business School <coughs> reading these, establishing a new way to take into account the biasing by not sampling globally. And when she did, she gets an average of 1.2 million. This is a very, I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but this is a huge story in sea level research. You've overestimated sea level by probably 25% all this time in the 20th century. Now, in a sense, let me say one more thing before I go. You think, well, that's good news. But no, it's bad news. Because it means that instead of going from 1.6 to 1.3, you've gone from 1.2 to 3. Because there's no debate about this measure. Satellites sample the ocean enough that there's no such bias. So instead of going up by a little less than a factor of two, now it seems that we're going up in sea level in the last 20 years by about a factor of two and a half times the 20th century average. So good for the 20th century, bad for projections of sea level. Right? But I want to show you another thing she did, because she's produced this curve, this blue curve here, which you can see shows less of a rise in sea level than this brown one. So now she said, let me take what a scientist would call a bin, a time bin. I'll start at 1900, and I'll take the average sea level rise from 1900 to 1910. Then I'll do it 1901 to 1911, <laughs> 1902 to 1912, 1903 to 19, and she did all of that. And then she plots it on a histogram. So what she's doing here is, this isn't a straight line. Sea level in the 20th century did not go up even. There were oscillations in it. And we know why, by the way, there are oscillations there. Right? There's lots of arguments for, and well understood arguments, for why this isn't a straight line. Right? The fact that the climate cooled after the Second World War, because industries put all of this stuff in the atmosphere that served to reflect sunlight. We know that if it cooled, it means ice sheets were uh, spared a little bit of the warmth. Right? We know that. We also know when volcanoes pop up. When volcanoes pop off, Earth's climate cools for a decade or so afterwards. You see it in the sea level, right? So this variation is well understood in some, in some way. So what she's done is she's taken all of those bins. And what I've shown here is so this is a sea level rate for each one of those bins, 10-year bins. And those are the last 10 10-year 10 bins. So remember what I told you looking at this. I, I know it's annoying when people do this, but I, think I really want to go back here. I said to you that for the 2400 years prior to the 20th century, sea level rose by an amount roughly, well, certainly less, but nearly equal to what it did in 100 years. Now we're zooming into this 100 years. Right? So that means, so 2400 years of sea level rise is not equal to what we got in 100. Now we're looking at the last 100. And we're saying that in the last 10 years, the sea level rise has been much higher than the average over the last 100. So we didn't just accelerate from 2,500 years ago to the year 1900. We accelerated into the 20th century, but in the 20th century, we've also accelerated into the 21st century. The highest 10, 10 year bins, were the most recent. Sea level is rising now at an anomalous rate. Now, I always Natalia's going to chide me for including this. I always get this, uh, I was in a debate recently with an economist about climate change, and um, he talked about how it must be so depressing to study this, right? because it's just bad and it's getting worse. Right? Mm -hmm. But there are some good sides to this story. And Natalia sitting there is responsible for one of the more important positive pieces of news from what well, Natalia showed in a series of papers, all through, I've shown one here, but there were three or four. She showed something that nobody had expected. It's actually a piece of good news, if you can believe it. 
when you think of seal. And that is the following. I told you that when an ice sheet melts, I'm not going to do this. This is the sort of thing you're all a bit scared of. Even I'm a little scared of it when I see it. <laughs> if you, um, I told you that if you melt an ice sheet like Greenland or Antarctica, sea level will fall right, near that ice sheet. It turns out that helps the sea level, uh, that helps the ice sheet remain stable. The Antarctic is sitting in a bowl of water, basically. It's a marine-based ice sheet, at least in the West. If the Western, uh, West Antarctic ice sheet wasn't there, you'd have an ocean. So ice, as you all know, floats, right? So if you're sitting in this big bowl of water, right, you have to have a pretty thick ice sheet, enough mass to keep it ground, keep it on the bed. And what Natalia showed in this series of very important papers is that because sea level drops near the margin of the ice sheet, that will help the ice sheet remain stable. So what that means, I think, is that I talked to you about a sea level acceleration of two and a half times, right, from the uh, uh, 20th century to the last 10 or 15 years. It would have been worse if it were not for this piece of physics. There would have been more dramatic health but we're helped by this rather strange piece of physics that nobody thought of before Natalia thought of it. So those are my conclusions. I haven't talked to you about one really nice aspect of this fingerprinting work. I just showed you that by looking at it carefully, you can understand that 1.6 is actually 1.2, etc. But what you can do, and what we're trying to do, is now go that one step further, which I mentioned earlier, which is to say not how much it's rising in a global sense, Right? But where it's coming from and how it's regionally there. Because if you want to have to plan for some catastrophe of sea level rise, you're not going to care what the global average is. I can tell you it's three millimeters per year. But for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards for, North America and the East Coast will always be higher than the global average. Right? There are natural effects associated with the Ice Age along the East Coast of the US. That means if the global average is three, North America and East Coast, where you live, will see five, six millimeters per shape. Right? So that variability. Yeah. Do you see a difference in land ice melting versus marine ice melting? Because land ice hasn't been floating in water, so the displacement must be much bigger. Well, no. You're, you're quite right to make the distinction. If you're floating in water, so I have, to, I have to be very careful. If I'm just an iceberg floating in water and I melt, sea level won't do a thing. All that will happen is you'll fill the space that the iceberg vacates. Right? So a floating ice sheet melting will have no effect on sea level. So we only talk about grounded ice that's sitting on the ground. However, there are some ice that's sitting on the ground that are in what would be an ocean if they weren't there. That's the West Antarctic. And there's some ice, like most of Greenland, that is sitting on ground that's high and therefore not a marine ice sheet. So that word marine is sometimes mis you know, misinterpreted. Uh, and so the expectation is that the West Antarctic is more unstable than Greenland because it's sitting in this water. The question is, we have to take into account Natalia's effect. But certainly, if, uh, if sea level rose near the West Antarctic, that would be a problem. And in fact, this paper a month ago was, was focused on the Antarctic and suggested that you could start, you were seeing evidence of the beginning of a large-scale collapse of the ice sheet. But the most sensitive indicators of climate change, in terms of the ice reservoirs on Earth, aren't the polar ice sheets. Because remember, the poles stay relatively cold. Yes, they're warming up. Yes, those ice sheets are going to melt. And they may have started already this catastrophic start. But it's the large mountain glaciers, the tropical mountain glaciers, glaciers, I'm not sure, well, certainly the Kilimanjaro and glaciers like that. When I was a kid, if you read the snows of Kilimanjaro, right, by any way, you were told, well, you are never told that it would disappear. 20 years, you were told it would disappear in 40 years. Now you're told it would disappear within a decade. Right? Those ice sheets are melting very rapidly. So the ice sheets that you see going, this is like, so only half jokingly tell my classes, go now if you want to see it. Because it's not going to be there in 10 years. The ones that really are the most sensitive 
the most easily seen to be sensitive to climate change are tropical glaciers in high altitudes. And there's a guy at Ohio State named Lonnie Thompson, who's very famous. Anybody who studies climate will know him very well. He has these heroic efforts to go to these tropical things. You should really have him come and give a talk. It will be a travel log through tropical glaciers. It's unbelievable to see. And it's also, and I'm going too far in answering your question, but I went to Ohio State and gave a talk two years ago, and I was excited to meet him again, sort of a personal hero. And he showed me this vault, right? They have this huge area where they store the cores of ice that he brings down, right? And he reminded me that 30% of the ice now, it's not really just a vault for ice, it's a museum, because those ice glaciers are gone, right? And in another 20 years, it'll be 70%, right? So those ice cores will be all that's left of those tropical glaciers. That's the most sensitive element of the Earth system. The poles tend to stay cold. It's going to take them a while. Right? So, as I was saying, local sea level is all planners. I'm invited to planning conferences all the time, and they don't care about the local sea level. They don't want me to talk about what the average is. They want me to talk about what's going to happen at Martha's Vineyard, for example. Right? And I've already said this. The most sobering part of it is the sea level rise is accelerating. From the last 2,000 years, to the last hundred, and the last hundred to the last ten, there is no doubt that we're, we're in an era, an era now in which sea level is certain to rise on the order of a meter by the time we get to the end of this century. Unless we take carbon out of the atmosphere, there's nothing we can do about that. It's too late. Right? We're going to see on the order of a meter, no matter what we do, unless we find a technology that will take that carbon out of the atmosphere. So, sorry for that somewhat depressing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. I think you, Greg, you, you were referring to this when you showed the hockey stick. Isn't that what it's called? I believe the hockey stick, that term. That, that That's, term. Uh, people refer to the hockey stick uh, less, it's it's uh, temperature, right? Yes. I wasn't showing temperature. I showing it looks like hockey stick, too. Um, the truth of the matter is, to start with, carbon dioxide, levels of toxic levels of carbon dioxide, you're referring to before mankind was, was, was around. Uh, reached a tremendous time at what we call the KP boundary, the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary, in which you had an extinction event. And this was, this is reflected in the rock record uh, with an absence of coral reefs until the Miocene. Yeah. You have nothing out there because the carbon dioxide levels killed everything, and that is not the first time, this is not, this is not the first rodeo of the Earth has seen in that regard. So it's not the first, it's not first rodeo, first show. Right. That's what I mean by that. Um, of high carbon, of high CO2 concentrations that were much higher than today. Right. So, but this is why I began this talk by saying that my central interest isn't modern sea level. Yes. It's yes. paleo sea level. Because for each of the events that this gentleman's talking about, we can ask what happened. A recent event, for example, 14,000 years ago, called Mount Water Pulse One End. Often what I also hear is there have been times where sea level has risen faster than today, short periods of time. 14,000 years ago, sea level rose 15 meters in 100 years. This is another thing you hear. You say, well, wait a minute, there was nobody around to pollute the atmosphere at that point, right? But we know full well why that happened. You were coming out of an ice age. And as you were coming out of an ice age, you did, there were certain periods when those large ice sheets destabilized, right? And when they did, things happened to the climate system. Another one was 12,000 years ago. When the ice sheets in North America moved north, when they retreated, all that water that they had sort of dammed up flooded through down the St. Lawrence into the ocean and it had a dramatic effect on the Earth's climate. Paradoxically, it cooled the climate. You were in a warming period, but then you were dumping all of this water into the ocean that led to a temporary cooling. So those sorts of things, another event that we've studied a lot is called PETM. High, you know, very technical, called Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum. A time when temperatures rose dramatically, right? And what can we learn from the PETM? So rather than to look at those events and say, well, these, this has happened before, what did we learn from the PETM? This was an event that's now thought to be a time where methane became unstable in the oceans, entered the atmosphere, temperatures rose by seven, eight, nine degrees. The problem with that story when you study the PETM and the world's 
best that that or it can stay is that that level of carbon input into the atmosphere is less than one degree today, right? So uh, I have a colleague, Paul Hoffman, a very famous Canadian geologist, but he was my predecessor at Harvard. I guess I only filled that room with Canadians. But he <laughs> is uh, very famous for talking about the paleo in really wonderful terms. You should also have him come and give a talk here. And what he tell, tells you is that the Earth provides us with experiments. If we want to know what the effect that life has had on the Earth, we'll look to when life did not exist on Earth in compared. If we want to know what happened when there was a huge influx of carbon, then we'll look, because there'll be evidence. There'll be times in Earth's history where carbon entered the atmosphere for a variety of technique, reasons at very rapid rates. So I find the paleo more interesting for two reasons. One is that there's less people studying it, so you can mull over things a little bit more than you can when you're studying more than sea level. But also it provides us with experiments we can't do. If you want to know where sea level is going in the next hundred years, now I'm sort of editorializing a little bit. One way to do it is run climate models, these big complicated climate models. I think an equally important way to do it is to look to the past. And by doing that, you learn so much. We've written several papers in the last few years about so-called interglacials, periods like today when the ice sheets had reached their minimum. Right? And then we asked ourselves, those periods are times of warmth. What happened in those interglacials? In those cases, natural warmth. What happened? In every case that's ever been studied, when you had an interglacial that had even a moderate level of warming, the polar ice sheets collapsed. Right? So there's an experiment. Right? So yes, there are certainly examples where carbon influx into the atmosphere at very high rates. You're right. We have a great rock record that tells us that. But in, and I'm not suggesting you were saying this. But instead of thinking, well, so this is all a natural process, the next question you should ask is, well, what happened then? Right? Don't stop at telling me the carbon supply would have risen in the atmosphere. What happened? And every time you study it, you see that uh, in that case, there were no ice sheets around. This was what was called a hot house earth already. But whenever warming happened through natural processes, at times in which ice sheets existed, polar ice sheets collapsed. There's no, no exception. Right? So that's sober. Isn't velocity also a big factor? I mean, if, if warming happened over 10,000 years, that's a different effect than if it happens over 100 years. Very big factor. If we melt ice, a central factor, if we melt ice, what you do is, there's a terrible term for this, it's called hosing. So the imagination is, you're melting ice and you're, you're sitting there with the hose, dumping fresh cold water into the ocean. Right? Why is, and this is what I teach my second year students, why is it that um, cities on the same latitude as Toronto, for example, in Europe, why is it that they're much warmer? Paris is not Toronto. Right? What, what's the difference? The difference is the ocean is bringing up warm waters. The winds that come across the Atlantic that freeze us, always called, in, we know this in Boston, they're always called Canadian winds, right? Come across, right? Freeze Toronto, freeze Boston, but then they're warmed by this oceanic heat, right? And then by the time they get to Europe, they're wet, so Paris is quite wet in the winter, but it's also warmer. So the question is, that that ocean circulation that would bring that warm water up for those high latitudes, what stops it? Because there have been periods in Earth's history where it stops, and in 100 or 200 year time scales, Paris becomes Toronto. Right? Not, no, nothing recently, the last one 12,000 years ago. And now the answer that's now well understood is it doesn't matter how much you're putting in, it matters how much, how quickly you're putting in. If you're putting it in at a rate that the ocean cannot adjust to it, you can shut this conveyor belt down. Right? So absolutely, the rate is a central question. It's also a central question for ice sheet stability. How, how long is it taking you to warm? Right? But ultimately, if you warm, even over a long period of time, you may have to wait for a longer period of time, but those ice sheets will <coughs> equilibrate, as it's called, to the temperature that exists at the time they're there. Uh, all the carbon that we're dumping into the atmosphere now by burning oil and coal was originally 
was sequestered from the atmosphere yeah. by plants in the Carboniferous era. Absolutely. So what were the conditions that led to uh, the decarbonated uh, well, utilization of the atmosphere in those times? So that's a whole sequence of processes, right? So you have carbonated platforms on Earth today. So that raises a paleo question, right? Because if I, I sh could show you, we could get online, and you would see Earth's temperature and it oscillates. This is another thing that people talk about, this oscillating temperature, right? And you go through what are known as periods of ice house and periods of hot house, right? Periods where there was no ice around. How do you sequester carbon is the question. The way you do it is through precipitation, brings down, it weathers rocks, there's a process called chemical weathering, which takes that carbon, mixes it with the residue of these rocks that are being weathered, and buries it down into the ocean. And those, those sediments get buried and buried and buried, buried, you produce carbonate platforms. Some of those platforms actually then get subducted in the Earth's interior, but some stay there. There's a theory that was just published a few years ago that argues that those long-term changes in temperature are all linked to how many of these carbon-heavy platforms we have around the globe at any one time. And as you bury them, right, the system gets, uh, uh, you, you reduce CO2 in the atmosphere and the system gets colder and vice versa. So there are natural ways in which you sequester carbon and chemical weathering is largely the way you do that. There's an interesting, you're going to learn not to ask me a question because I go on too long and answer, but there's a very interesting uh, ex extreme example. You know, I joke with my students that they all want something extreme now. It can't just be warming, it has to be extreme warm. There was an extreme event 800 million years ago called Snowball Earth. 800 million years ago, the Earth was a total ice ball. There was no place on the Earth's surface that wasn't ice over. Right? It's a very fascinating time for all sorts of sciences, biology, for example, etc. Why did we enter Snowball Earth? Right? The answer now, it seems, is that you had unusual amounts of weathering because the continents were at the equator. Continents move around. So it just turned out that 800 million years ago, most continents were at the equator. Therefore, they were warm, subject to warm temperatures, higher precipitation rates. So by doing that, you had a huge spike in the amount of uh, CO2 that you were taking out of the atmosphere. So that tells you the strength of that process. Because if there's enough of that process going on, you're going to cool the Earth so much, it's going to enter a deep freeze. The whole thing will enter a deep freeze. And how did we leave snow water? We left it because volcanoes didn't stop spewing CO2. So it took another few million years for those volcanoes to spew enough CO2. They warmed, it warmed, it warmed, and then all the ice melted. So those processes can take tens of millions of years, or they can take a million years. What we're doing is taking decadal timescales. It's a whole different timescale. Well, no, I pointed to you. At a very simple level, because uh, many opponents like visual imagery, yeah. could you just recap the Roman fish tanks? Yeah. Are you saying that those fish tanks are swimmable, but they're below the sea level? Is that what you said right. earlier? So let's, let's go to a picture of them. Right. Okay, so there's a fish tank. And he's standing on he's it. Standing on it. Right? He's got uh, rubber boots on, so he probably is at ankle under the water. These are deeper. You can swim out. I wasn't here. I was here. You swim out and you have sort of fun here. Uh, nobody bothers you. But that's the top of the fish tank. Right? And so imagine the height of this uh, chair. That's the top of the fish tank. The Romans would have had to build that so water levels would never get higher, higher than the if they got that high, fish would go. Right? So they had to uh, build them at a very specific height, that height. And so now you can simply ask, what height are they at now? And that change over that 2,500 years tells you how much water levels must have changed in that area. Thank you. I listened to your um, allocution of the different uh, cities in Europe and how. Um, of the, of the um, centuries and the cities have been affected. It's modern. I'm coming to the modern era now. But let's take a moment, you being a Bostonian, me being a Buffalonian. Yeah. 
Well, I'm a Trumptonian, so we're close. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, that's, that might be worse. I'm not sure. Because you're, the, that's the, you're, that's you're on the worst worse. side of the lake. Right. We'll be in the full blast. Yeah, that's my question. You're the Trumptonian called you the mistake by the lake. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. so being, being a victim of that, how do you explain that? There's very little change at all. In I'm going back 50 years. Change in years. In sea level? Or? Uh, in terms of the climate change right. during the winter? I'm, 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 I'm oh, watching. No, I, I disagree with I'm you. I'm going to sea level as well because I went there last winter. Well, but, okay, but the, the lakes are, they're not uh, connected to the ocean, right? They're locked up. So that nothing that happens, like Ontario is just about the These sheets of ice that are, are the way they are right. have no relation to these. Okay, well, I can, so it's an interesting question. And the, uh, I often get this sort of question in different forms. So what you have to be careful of, of course, is to say that climate is not weather. Right? Weather changes year to year. We have bad winter, we have it, right? You have to look for long-term trends, right? But I've lately told my classes that if you're my age, 50, basically, um, climate is becoming weather. Because when we moved from Australia to Toronto in the 70s, and I have facts, figures to support this, right? And trust me, as an Australian who found himself in a Toronto winter, right? I remember it vividly, and my poor parents. What you had to do in the 70s in Toronto, you didn't just have a shovel, you had a pick, right? Do you know that in the year 2010, right? 95% less picks are sold in Canadian Tire, the major hardware store, than was sold in 1970. You no longer have winters in Toronto where the ice sheet is two inches thick on sidewalks and you sit there slamming. You have ice storms on occasion. But the fact of the matter is, there is a discernible, even, even sort of qualitatively, informally discernible change in climate in Toronto. I haven't lived in Buffalo, but in Toronto, there's no doubt about it. You never need a pick to pick through ice that, that you wake up to. Yeah, Toronto is relatively mild when compared to the mistake. But it's, you asked me about changes in climate. Right. Changes. All right. All right. All right. So I think, to be honest, Buffalo might be the wrong place to look for these changes because you're always going to get huge snowfalls there. You have this lake effect snow, it's hard for you to understand what, that's a very local climatological effect versus a broader scale one, right? So. Uh, you mentioned the uh, distorting effect on ocean currents. Yeah. The, um, the one we had um, Superstorm Sandy, yeah. I remember hearing that the jet stream mm -hmm. had been affected. That's where you have to say, is, is that, Certainly the jet stream, yeah. the geographic, the location of the jet stream does change as climate change. Right? There's no doubt about it. So when we look at sea level records, part of the variation that we see is simply because currents are moving location. That certainly happens. But with Sandy, the central issue was sea level is priming you here for a variety of reasons. Right? You're on the east coast of the US. You're getting melting which is raising your sea level, let's say even by the average of two millimeters per year. But you also, and this is something I haven't talked about, you also live in a very bad place, uh, geophysically speaking, because there were large ice sheets over Canada 20 to 5,000 years ago. And that caused a depression in the Canadian crust. You're in New York and in Boston, just at the edge or a little bit outside the main ice sheet. So instead of having a depression, those regions came up, the land came up. So as Canada rebounds, and it does, and it's easy to measure, there's no problem, right? As the Canadian crust goes up one centimeter per year, because it's still coming up because of those ice sheets, the US East Coast is, what's on, what, is on what's known as the peripheral bulge of the ice. It's going down. And as land goes down, in a place like New York, you have a natural sea level rise because of this of two to three millimeters per year. So just because of the land doing what it's naturally supposed to do because of the glacier. So think about it. You have two, three millimeters per year because of what we're doing to our environment. You add another two or three millimeters per year that you'd be seeing even if we didn't do anything to our environment because of this natural effect. 
and then you really got hit because that that storm surge happened at high tide. Right? The damage inflicted by Sandy would have been much less if the storm surge had happened at low tide. So you've got a triple whammy here, and and you're going to get. You know, I'm not suggesting there'll be more Sandys, in it, but in a global sense, there's going to be more Sandys. Sea level is rising higher. Whenever there's a storm surge that happens to hit, I think it, it hit within 10 minutes of high tide, you're in trouble. Right? You're in trouble. But what about the jet stream? Yeah, well, the jet stream, so if you move the jet stream, right, you will move because the atmospheric circulation affects the surface of the water. We look at oceans and we just see them as flat except for the waves. But in fact, they are flat to a physicist, but they have variations in height that are linked to these atmospheric effects. So if you change the location of the jet stream, right, wherever the jet stream exists, sea level will actually, where it's at its highest, sea level will fall below the jet stream. But I defer to Dave on that. He's the expert on those things. Right? Yeah. Um, you made an interesting statement about the Netherlands, and yeah. we would probably agree that it, it, I noticed you looked at each other when I said that. <laughs> I mean, the Dutch uh, may have made some, some uh, stupid mistake by starting a country in the swamp uh, 500 years ago. And some say that we, uh, that we better start uh, making good, uh, become good friends with the Germans. But uh, what recommendation would you have for the Dutch Delta Commission uh, in terms of modeling? Well, you're asking for an engineering answer, right? So, one of those startling things, I belong to something called the Harvard University Center for the Environment. And what's shocking to me, I'm, I'm speaking as a lay person is how quickly the cost of remediation goes up. Mm -hmm. If sea level went up in Holland by a meter, you would have to spend much more than twice if it went up a half a meter. In fact, you'd have to spend about 10 times. Right? What I would suggest is a rather strange answer. I would suggest you look to China and you should find, give China incentive not to burn all the coal they have. If you give China that incentive, and it's not good enough to wrap their and say, because they'll say what all countries like China will say is, well, right, you've been burning oil for the last century, you want us to stop now, right? But the fact of the matter is, if you don't give those countries incentives to stop using coal, you're not going to stop this process. Right? Find their solar panels. Sorry? Find their solar panels. So right, so you have, to, <laughs> you have to do something. So we, I, you know, I'm giving a very... Al Gorean response, right? <laughs> you have to, you're a global community, and it's not going to be, there's nothing that the Netherlands can do on its own, right, to change the fate it's going to have on the world. That's an obvious statement, right? The costs of the Netherlands are going to be huge. If they're particularly, if they're, so this report in Nature that said that the West Antarctic was showing evidence of larger scale collapse. That is the worst possible route the Netherlands could get for the reasons that I described to you. Right? I don't think it's economically feasible right, to, to, for the Netherlands to deal with the two meter sea level rise right, over 100 or 150 years. Right? What's interesting about this is that I was in a debate once, many years ago, with an economist, a debate I lost, because he convinced the audience that doing something about climate change right, would ruin the world economy. And he put out a figure of like $500 billion, right? Which seemed to me not so bad, actually. Um, but nevertheless, it was 1990-something, right? And he just whipped me in this debate, right? And I always, I sent him an email when the US <coughs> government tried, said that they would bail out AIG insurance, $400 billion, right? And so somehow, climate is never on the front burner. The other thing, if I could editorialize a little bit more, in my talks in Europe, I noticed, in particular, people would say to me, prove it. Right? And my answer to them is, okay, I've shown you what a scientist can show you. If you don't want to believe it, that's your prerogative. Right? But I would ask them, because it's always non-scientists who say prove it, because they don't know the way the scientific method works. I would say to them, do you feel that your government makes every decision on the basis of proven 100% facts? When the US government was bailing out those banks and insurance companies, was it doing it because there was 100% consensus in the economic community that that was what? So we make decisions all the time based on the propensity of evidence. At least we hope our government does. Right? 
If you are a sane person, the propensity of evidence tells you that we are in a time of climate crisis. Right? I didn't start this work being such a negative naysayer. Right? But I've ended it. Right? We're in a time of crisis. So if you want to wait for 100% proof, you go right ahead. And I once had a computer scientist who said to me, we don't have to worry because we're producing such strong computers now, <laughs> such powerful computers, that we can solve these problems in 10, 20, 30 years. He literally said that to me again in the debate. And the only retort I could have to him was, well, I hope your computer can float. Right. <laughs> you're, you're too late. Uh, uh, that's not going to help you, that powerful quantum computer. So the Netherlands on its own cannot do it. The Netherlands will, fa will certainly face economic hardship if it has to deal with anything over a meter of sea level rise. And what part of the Netherlands are you from? Uh, but it's just a little bit above uh, what would be flooded. Right, so, you know, you know there's a broad expanse of the Netherlands that is going to be hit very hard indeed. Right. So I'm going to you should uh, wrap it up here at 7.30, but the jury's going to hang around a bit.